Good morning. I'm so glad to see you all here on this Memorial Weekend. Just a couple of things as we start. I hope all of you had a chance to be at Summer Palooza. If you weren't, you missed quite an event. I've only been there a couple of times now, but some of the people that have been there longer tell me it was certainly at the top of one of our biggest. One of the exciting things, though, is Jason posted a picture, a video, early that morning on Wednesday, in which he said we're at 249. And he said, I am not kissing a donkey unless we make 250. You'll be happy to know that we got 256 pre-registrations, the largest we've ever had. And you'll be happy to know that Jason kissed the donkey. Not once, but if you see Bailey Day congratulate her because she couldn't get the camera just quite right. That was her claim. And Jason ended up having to kiss the donkey seven times. <laughs> if you've seen the, the video, you may note that the donkey shows more disgust than Jason does. Second, would you raise your hand if you're a bet? We've got three, four here, okay? We want to especially thank you this morning. I don't know that anybody that's not been on a battlefield can ever appreciate what it's like. And I know some of you were and some of you weren't on battlefields, but you all gave a part of your life to make this country greater. And we appreciate it so very much. But we also remember today that many paid the ultimate the ultimate cost for that. I have a gold star mother in my church at Shelton that I know is hurting this morning. Her son was 18 years old when he was killed in Afghanistan. Freedom comes with a cost. It behooves us to live in a way that merits the sacrifice of others. Next, Linda, would you raise your hand? Okay, you're going to hear more of this in the future, but I want you to know what this lady does. And it really impresses me because I was at a Casting count, Crowns concert you have to understand that although it's become apparent to me that Jamie Brown loves Third Day, and I have, well, I have to say I'm falling in love with them too, but my number one Christian group is Casting Crowns. And for my birthday, my daughter got me a ticket. I think she regretted it because I was standing and singing with them the whole time. But the leader, of the band told us at one point, he said, we want you to know that before this concert began, we and the technicians, every one of us, went and prayed over every seat in this auditorium. We prayed for the person that would be sitting in that seat. We prayed that God would touch their hearts that day. We prayed that they would leave closer to God. 
I want you to know that Linda is here every morning on Sundays praying over every seat in this church. Now, I say that for this reason. The prayer team is expanding. We have a wonderful prayer team that takes your prayer requests and prays over them during the week. But Linda's vision is taking us farther. And one of the things I want to invite is that if there is anybody here that thinks it's important to pray for the people in worship, to pray for the kids in Discovery Zone, to pray for our wonderful youth infusion, I want you to talk to Linda after this service and let her know that you would like to be a part of that important ministry. Because I know that your lives are going to change today. And frankly, it has nothing to do with me or my sermon. Over the years, I've learned that God acts despite me. I know that lives are going to change because we ask for that in prayer. And God is faithful. If you'd like to be a part of making that happen, visit with Linda, and she'll be happy to help you and, and to talk about it. Lastly, at the back of the church, you will find these journals. I better get it right. This is this morning's. This is something that Jason and Karen put together to help enrich your experience during these sermons. It's a journal that re, you know, asks questions and encourages you to reflect on the scripture each week. So we encourage you to take one of these, to use it, and to be richly blessed by it. I also would encourage you to be in prayer for Karen. She is one stubborn lady. She had a major accident which did not keep her from being at Summer Palooza because she had a job to do. She's not here this morning, though, because she's in a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, and she does have a mild concussion, which is beginning to show some effects. So please be praying for Karen. Let's pray together. Gracious and Heavenly Father, I thank you for the presence of your beloved spirit. Lord, there is nothing more important in life than the spirit that comes to us as teacher and friend and the one who loves our souls. Father, I pray and I invoke that you might pour the power of your living spirit upon each and every one of us as we gather here this morning, that you may open our hearts to your truth, that you may help us to hear the words that you alone speak through the Spirit to our hearts. And that you help us to leave as people who have been in the presence of the living God and whose lives have been changed because of your love. Amen. I began my ministry as a youth pastor. In fact, I almost didn't begin my ministry because in seminary, we had to write a ministry paper. I asked the professor what a ministry paper was, and he said, well, you tell us about your ministry. I got mine back and on the front, and understand, I graduated Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Illinois, 
in the top 8% of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I graduated with honors. I had never gotten back a paper that said what this did. It said, this is the most Mickey Mouse paper I have ever read in my entire life. I went to him and I said, you said, talk about my ministry, and I did. I said, I want to be a pastor to kids, and he said, yes, we're talking theology. We really don't care what you want to be. So he got me a couple of good theology books. And within a week, I became a theologian. He liked my second paper better. I know how to please. I started in youth ministry because I love youth with an absolute passion. I apologize to all of you, but I have to be honest and say there's nobody in the church that matters to me as much as our youth. I think I made a mistake because around the age of 32, I decided I was too old to be successful as a youth pastor. So I dropped out and began a preaching ministry. How exciting it is to find that you're too old at 30, but at 70, you're fine again. So I'm really back to enjoying what I love the most about ministry working with our youth. And I have to tell you, our youth are struggling today. Not only with the normal things we're aware of, a number of our youth have been bullied and are going through other problems and traumas. But the thing that stands out to me that I didn't have to deal with is they're struggling with their faith. They believe in Jesus. They believe in the scripture. And it brings them into a conflict that they have trouble resolving. That conflict sometimes has to do with friends who are gay and how you relate to them. And more and more in the city of Lincoln, they're struggling with friends who are of other religions. And they like them. They're good people. They live good lives. They're friendly, they're compassionate, they're caring. And our kids are sitting there saying, if what I've been taught is right, they can't go to heaven and it makes no sense to me. They're good, they're loving, they're caring. Why, why are they wrong? And a number of our kids are struggling. It's been around for a while because I remember one of my youth who was in college at the time coming to me and saying, every religion can get people to heaven, right? That's a hard moment for a pastor. Because I don't know about you, but what I want to say is something to make him feel better. But then I'm struggling with the scripture. And I said to him, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he looked at me and he said, I cannot be a part of a religion that that, that's that narrow-minded. Now I hope and pray that God brought him back. 
I did what I could, but not successfully at the time. But our kids are struggling with very real faith issues. And to be honest, there are issues that face us too. I once had a couple in my office, and the only thing I knew about that couple really is what I had learned a week ago. And that is that they were having an affair before they each were married, and that the affair had continued through all the years of the marriage and had just been found out. They were in my office because they wanted me to marry them. Now, I wish I could tell you that that was a simple thing. But they were from a powerful family in the church. And I struggled. Do I risk losing this family? I finally decided I had to move the way the Lord was urging. And I said, I cannot marry you. I said, your relationship has destroyed two homes. It has torn apart the lives of children. I cannot bring God's blessing upon that relationship. Now, I've learned in life that irregardless of what I do, there are others that will do what they want to do, and they got married. But brothers and sisters, every one of us, I could pass the mic to any of you, and you could share a story of how you've struggled with faith issues. The sermon series that we're about to enter on, and I think Jason is going to do the heart of the preaching, but he's having, I don't know if he's having fun this morning or if he's still brushing his teeth. But one way or another, he's going to bring the heart of this message to you. But I have the privilege of talking first about the urgency of the gospel. So I want you to take out your scriptures. Remember, if you don't have a Bible, there's one at the back of the church. It's not for your use here, it's for you to keep, to take home, to mark up, to use in whatever way you want to. And be aware that you also can call up your phone apps. And if you've got the U Bible on it, open it up and click on events, and you will find horizons and Thanks to Pipa and Karen, everything will be there that you need, the scriptures and everything else. The question we face this morning is what is truth? And I have to tell you that truth has to come, in my opinion, from the Holy Scripture. It has to come from there because, number one, I'm a sinner. And I don't trust that I have the ability to speak God's complete truth. Over the years, men and women far greater than I am one of them, St. Paul, spoke God's truth. Paul was an amazing man. He recognized that he was a sinner. And he recognized the consequences of what that meant. The scripture is important to me because we are told that God through the Holy Spirit, breathed his words into the hearts 
of the men who wrote these books. Now, understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that every word here is literally correct. Number one, if you have seen the ancient manuscripts, you would know that there are way too many holes, and I mean that literally. Sometimes one manuscript gives different information and we're able to fill in the holes, but sometimes, frankly, the people doing the translation have to guess at what word may have been there. And secondly, we have to understand that when scripture is taken from the original Greek and Hebrew and translated into English, that you automatically have built into the translation the bias of those who translated the scripture. Now, as I say that, I still have to say that the only truth I can trust comes from this book. Because I believe that God breathed the Holy Spirit into the men and spoke the words he wanted them to share. I believe that God helped them put the right words on paper. And I believe that the men and women who translated these words into modern translations were inspired by the Holy Spirit who helped them make the best possible translation. There was a time when I struggled with scripture. And I want to say that just to be honest. When I was in the University of Illinois, my sister wrote me a letter telling me that she was very sorry that I was going to burn forever in the fires of hell. Apparently the sin I had committed was that I had gone to college. Anybody here gonna burn in the fires of hell with me? A few of you, okay. Well, my sister ticked me off. I, am I the only one whose brother or sister has ever ticked them off? Okay. My sister ticked me off, so I actually spent some time in the scripture and I wrote her a letter back. In those days, we didn't have email. We actually had to write things. I wrote her a letter back in which I pointed out seven contradictions in scripture. She wrote me back and said that I was in far greater danger of the fires of hell than she had originally thought. It didn't get any better from there. But I made a decision. If I can judge the Bible and say this part of it is true, but this part isn't, then I have put myself in a phenomenal place. I have really put myself in the place of God and saying and defining what ultimate truth is. There are times that I don't understand the scripture. There are times that I question the scripture. Some of those times don't really matter to me. As an example, I've read theologians' books talking about Holy Communion. I've read theologians' books talking about the essence of Christ. Those guys really like to talk. I've come to the conclusion that I don't care. I will never understand the mystery of communion. And that's all right. All I need to understand is that when I speak those words, Jesus has promised to be there. Nothing else matters. He's not there because I understand it. He's there because he promised to be there. 
He's not there because I'm perfect in my ministry. He's there despite my imperfections because he's perfect in his promises. But there are times when what the scripture says matters and I need to understand it. And those are times I struggle. What is the truth? In Ephesians, the second chapter, Paul says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. Likewise, in the 8th chapter of Romans, Paul says, Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. The scripture tells us that the truth is that you and I are sinners. By the way, I apologize if I just shocked any of you. Was there anybody here that wasn't aware of that? I, I ask that sincerely in a way, jokingly mostly, because there are people that think their life is fine. I was one of them. You know, when you're living the way of the world, Paul just told us the truth. When we're living the way of the world, we don't have the faintest idea what God's way is. We don't think of ourselves as sinning. We're just like everybody else. I can recall, now never around my mother, because for you younger kids who are present, there was a day and an age when mothers, well, if I said a word my mother didn't like, I got to chew a bar of soap. That is not a pleasant experience. It taught me one thing at the time, to make sure that my mother wasn't around when I said inappropriate things. Do you hear what I said? It didn't stop me from it. When I was with my friends and they were living the way they did, I lived that way. And I never thought anything of it. Then one day Jesus Christ came into my world and he shined the light of his truth on me. And I did not like anything I saw. I began to see life in his light. And I began to realize how filled with sin I was. And I regretted it deeply. 
But I found another truth that Paul stated. It didn't matter that I regretted it. I didn't know what to do about it. I just felt like I was stuck. Paul describes that state earlier in Romans. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want you to hear what that says. It says that death is not something that comes upon us at the end of life. Death is something we live in when we live in sin. It's something that kills our souls and changes our souls and enslaves us to a way of life. And the only freedom from that power is through God who loves us and sends the Holy Spirit upon us to set us free. And while we're living in death, he gives us life and he frees us from the power of sin. What is truth? There's something I have to tell you about Jesus. Whoops, I've also got to be careful though because our sound man who shall remain nameless told me that he was keep on the clock. What I have to tell you about Jesus is this. People who say he was a good man are wrong. Jesus is either who he said he was, or Jesus was one of the most insane people the world has ever known. There is no in-between. Jesus either spoke the truth, or the things Jesus said make him crazy. Do you doubt it? Listen to what he said. Can you picture if I said to you, I, by the way, folks, am the way, the truth, and the life. You're never going to get to God unless it's through me. If I thought that and believed it, how many of you would think I was crazy? Oh, come on, be honest. Uh-huh. You see, there is no room in this for goodness. Jesus didn't claim to be a good guy. Jesus did not claim to be a guy who knew about life and how to live a good life. Gandhi said that. When Gandhi was a good man. Jesus claims were that he was the living son of the Holy One in heaven. That claim is either nuts or it is correct. If it is nuts, then anything he said has to be tossed out the window. If it is correct, then when Jesus speaks, the living God is speaking. What is truth? Knowing the condition of our life. Knowing that we're dead in sin. Knowing that we're slaves to sin. 
knowing that we're powerless to get out of it, Jesus spoke these words. Jesus answered him, I am the way and the truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How do we at truth? There are one of three ways. The one way is becoming very popular in the world. We simply reject what Jesus said. More and more, some of the leading pastors in Christianity are, are making statements like, God is love and everyone's going to go to heaven. It doesn't matter how we live. It doesn't matter what we believe. We're all going to get to heaven. I remember questioning one of my colleagues once. And I said to him, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he said, and Jesus was right. No one comes to the Father except through him, but there are a whole lot of ways people can come to God. Sometimes in our desire to make things feel good for ourselves, we can say some incredibly silly things. Jesus knew that the Father was God, and he knew that the only way was through him. Why? Because I'm a sinner. You understand what I'm saying? A sinner cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. It doesn't matter. A sinner cannot stand in the presence of the holy God. Jesus makes me whole. Jesus pays the price for my sin. And Jesus makes me holy so that I can stand in the presence of God. The second way we can live is, in my opinion, just as wrong. It's, for lack of better words, let's just say it's the Westboro approach. Have you all heard of Westboro Baptist Church? We had the privilege of interacting with them one day because one of the police officers in Ashland had been killed on his way to duty. And they decided that that was an event worthy of their traveling from Kansas up to Ashland, Nebraska. They stood on the street corner that the funeral would have to bypass with their hate. And signs that said things I will not say today because they're despicable. But their attitude is that if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to burn in the fires of hell forever. There's no way around it. There's no other truth. I think they're nuts. I don't think they're nuts because I think there may be other truths. I think they're nuts because I don't think God has called us to hate. I don't think the one who loved the world has called us to toss truth out the window and just condemn people. Now I know that creates problems. I had this guy in one of my churches, oh, God bless him, I'm sure he'll be in heaven, but it will be despite my wishes at times. He was a very different person. He told me he was unhappy with the hymns once and that as a result he wasn't coming back to church. So I went out to see him and he Ah, you're out here, huh? I thought you might be before too long. And I said, well, tell me what you consider to be a good hymn. He said, amazing grace. 
I said, yeah, great hymn, love it. But I do three, sing, three songs a Sunday. He said, repeat it. I said, okay, I've learned something now. Sometimes we as stiff Christians can be so stubborn we lose sight of who God is. I don't think God calls you and I to condemn. I don't think God asks us to judge other people. Now, don't get me wrong. I think sometimes we have to judge whether or not we're going to interact with certain people. But I don't think God asks us to be the ones who stand between heaven and hell. So where do we stand? Brothers and sisters, I have to tell you that this is one of those times when I think what we have to do is trust God. I know that Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I know that Jesus said there is no way to God except through him. I also know that there are many people of other faiths and religions that are good, loving people. And I don't understand. I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand in my head. I know what sin is. I know how sin keeps us from... God's love. But I can't imagine, I can't imagine heaven without Mahatma Gandhi. I know you people are all so young, you probably don't even know who the man is. He died the year I was born. But he's perhaps one of the greatest men that's lived on earth. A man of peace and a man of love. I know the truth. I believe the truth. And I have to understand that I have an urgency to share that truth. I hope every one of you have an urgency to share that truth. I hope that if you truly believe that Jesus is the life and you see friends who are living in sin, I hope that you don't want to leave them there. I hope you have an urgent passion to share the truth. But don't ever judge. Trust God. Speak the truth. Live the truth so that people can see in you what it is to be a Christian. Love other people. Nobody that I know of has ever been won to Christ by anything but love. Anybody here ever had somebody say to you, you're going to burn in the fires of hell, and you said, God, I want to love that God. No. We know the truth, but we're called to be the children of love. You see, the greatest truth I know is this, that God out of his love reached out to me when I was the worst sinner there was. And he held me in his arms and he said, I love you. And if you want to know the truth, let people know that God loves them. Let them see it in the way you live their li your life. Let them see it in the words you speak. Let us pray. Heavenly Father.